Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Andreas. I work at Twig, and yeah, today I'm going to be comparing uh, Buck and Basil. Um, if you're interested, you can find the code and the slides for this on my GitHub, um, a Herman, and then 2023 build meetup. And um, yeah, I work at Twig. Uh, we help our clients with build system migrations and optimizations. We contribute to open source build systems. Systems have contributed to Basil. Uh, my colleague Alois and I were also. Uh, lucky enough to uh, contribute to Buck, as uh, Neil mentioned before. Um, so at a high level, uh, as you already uh, probably know, but I'll sort of quickly go over the basics. Uh, both of them are uh, build systems designed for monorepo uh, use cases to uh, scale to very large and polyglot um, use cases. Both of them have cross-platform support in the sense that you can build on different platforms and target different platforms, and both uh, promise uh, fast and correct or reliable uh, builds. Um, Bazel was developed by Google and open sourced in 2015 and is called Blaze internally in Google, which you may have heard. Uh, and Buck 2 was developed by Meta, open sourced this year, uh, is version 2 of Buck, um, and uh, Buck was inspired by Blaze. Um, all right, so how can you get started with either of those? With Bazel, um, there are install instructions multiple ways, but unless you're using Nix, I'd recommend just downloading Basilisk. Uh, and installing it as Bazel, and then you can pin the Bazel version in your project, and Basilisk is going to manage downloads and everything for you. With Buck 2, on the other hand, you can also download binary releases, um, or you can uh, install it from source uh, using Cargo, uh, which might be interesting because it's still moving a lot uh, uh, these days. Um, okay, what does a minimal project look like in each of those? Uh, in Bazel, as I mentioned, you can pin your version then you need to create a workspace file, which is a file that has to be there and de define sort of the root of the project. Uh, these days, you'll want to create a module.bazel file, which describes the name and version of your project and then its direct dependencies and also um, imports from package managers like Maven or, or NPM or something like this. That's part of Bazel's new package management and dependency management system called BZL mod that you, for now, still need to enable in your Bazel RC configuration file, but uh, starting from Bazel 7, that's going to be the default. Uh, and then uh, Bazel's build targets are defined in build files in uh, Starlark syntax. And um, here we're creating just an empty one to kind of have a valid project. And then with this, we get a working no of build. Uh, with Buck2, fortunately, it comes with a nice little uh, tool, Buck init, uh, which you can run to set up a minimal uh, project. Uh, Buck2 currently doesn't really have any external dependency management system like Bazel does. Uh, it assumes that what you're using is part of your repository, including uh, the default rules, so like how do you build a CC binary, CC library, and so on, that's called the prelude. And uh, you can just install that as a Git sub module if you want, uh, or in any other way. Um, and then what you get is a bug root, which defines the root of the project, somewhat similar to the workspace, and a bug config file, which defines the config of the project. Um, you get the prelude that I just mentioned, and tool chains, which defines the standard compiler tool chains you're going to use, and you can edit this if you have special needs. Um, and then Buck's version of build files is called Buck files. Um, and with that, you get a working minimal build. Um, so let's dive a bit more into usage and let's consider a simple C++ Hello World project. Let's uh, say it has a libcc uh, file that defines a hello function. Uh, it has a header file that exports, uh, exports that function and has a main module that imports that header and then uses that function. Uh, to build that in Bazel, you need to define build targets like these. Uh, one is a library target that captures the source and the header file. The other is a binary target that captures the source file and the dependency on that library target that we just defined, which captures those files and makes sure that the right files are forwarded at the right points of compilation and linking and so on. Um, and with that, we can now build our binary and run it, and Bazel is going to manage that for us. Or you could also run it directly. Uh, and then now you have your target graph, you can also query it. So for example, you can ask what does depend on the library CC source file in your project, RDEP means reverse dependencies, and you're gonna get the list of things that depend on that. Buck, if we consider the same Hello World example, looks very similar. Um, there's just some minor spelling differences essentially in the way it looks like a bug file uh, if we compare it to this. And then if you build it, uh, you're also going to be able to build and run and there is also a query feature. It's called uQuery for reasons I'm not going to go into here now. Um, and the query syntax also looks very, very similar. We have to convert the source into a target, so we have to ask for its owner. Otherwise, same thing. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about build isolation. 
so if we consider this hello world target, what happens? This header uh, attribute is the thing that makes sure that the header file is forwarded to the uh, compilation of our binary. If we comment this out, then what happens? Uh, let's consider the code for this. So I've commented out the header, and if I basil build hello, it's going to load a bit, and we're going to get a build error saying the header file is missing because we didn't declare it as an input anymore. And that's good because it means that Bazel enforces that our build definitions are correct. If we now try the same thing with buck, look into the buck file, the exported headers is commented out. Um, now the build succeeds. That's a bit unfortunate. Um, the reason for this uh, is that the local builds are not sandboxed. Buck2 relies on remote execution for the uh, isolation. So uh, both Bazel and Buck support remote execution. Uh, I'll very quickly jump over this because I think most people here are familiar with this. Uh, for this demo, I'm just going to use the remote worker that's included in Bazel's code base. It requires a bit of patching to work for Buck2, but we can make it work. So uh, I'm starting the remote worker uh, in the Bazel code base using this command line, which activates sandboxing and all. And now, once that is running, I can try my Buck2 build of hello again. And we get a build failure. Yay. So uh, this way, we get our isolation as we want it. OK, another thing I wanted to touch on, I'll skip over the details, but you can take a look at the code for how I've configured the remote execution part. Another thing I wanted to touch on is the static dependencies topic that Chris and Neil were already mentioning before. I'll work through a concrete example. So if we consider Haskell code, it has the same problem that uh, things need to be compiled in dependency order. So for example, if we have a project with a main module that depends on a module called say and a module called message, and message depends on hello Reykjavik, then uh, we need to, uh, it's enterprise grade uh, a modularization right there. Um, <laughs> we need to first compile hello and Reykjavik. They're going to generate interface files that are going to be needed to compile, uh, to compile message. And the same thing, we need to first compile say and message before we can build main. OK. And if we do this in Bazel and we want to define our target as just a single rule invocation, then we capture all those modules there. And now if we make an incremental change to just the Reykjavik module, we would hope that it only does a minimal rebuild. Uh, and at most, rebuilds what could be affected by this. But unfortunately, it's going to rebuild all those modules uh, over again. And that's because there are no dynamic dependencies in Bazel. And because of the build isolation, we don't have access to any previous outputs. Um, and we can get the fine granularity, but then we have to spell out the module dependency graph in Bazel itself. It's tedious to do by hand, so we developed the Gazelle extension, which is like Bazel build file generator to do that for you. But still, you know, noisy diffs and so on. Um, so Buck can handle this. Uh, you still have the uh, static target dependency graph for fast queries and so on, as was mentioned before, um, but a dynamic action graph for fine uh, grind incremental builds. And so we can define our Haskell binary as a single target and either use uh, what was mentioned before as incremental actions, where the whole thing is sort of just still one action, but the previous outputs are the new inputs, and we can just rely on the compiler's uh, incremental builds features. Um, it's nice to reuse those features. It's a bit risky. If you know something is missing, then you might still get your inhermeticities or, or uh, reproducibility issues. And the other way is with dynamic actions, where you sort of declare the scope of inputs and outputs up front, and then a special action uh, that generates uh, your uh, dependency graph. Um, and those have to be sort of limited to the scope of those pre-declared inputs and outputs. And then if you change Reykjavik, you're only going to rebuild the things uh, that you actually changed. And that is pretty much all I had. There is more to it. Uh, you can take a look at this blog post, uh, which also talks about external dependencies, the Starlock API, bug extension language, um, and uh, yeah, I work at Twig. You can learn more about the scalable builds group there. And um, thank you for listening. And maybe we have a minute for questions. Yeah. Yes, I don't know. Any questions? What's the reason for not having some boxing in Buck2? Is it intentional or? <laughs> so I, 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 I should <laughs> just neglect <laughs> that question. <laughs> so, so there are two reasons. So some of our actions genuinely are the effort. So we do need to be able to send it off. Uh, this is just. A, a porting issue, the one that will persist for years. Uh, we haven't bothered because we didn't need it. Uh, it would be very easy to add it as we are hoping one day someone writes a Rust library for run a command passing these things, and we don't have to build it in the build system, we can just reuse it. And then there's Enchflow and build form and their borrowings. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, yes. Plenty of remote execution options available. And even baseless remote worker works if you catch it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought that at least in book two, that it would really create like a temp directory and copy the files in. And no, it doesn't do it. Okay. It still doesn't say. I mean, it could be. Welcome. It's like a, it's like a minimal thing. There's uh, like that lazy new tree stuff you get though, right? Like you can catch some previous declared dependencies because of that, right? You know, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So like certainly yes. there, there are a lot of cases that will be caught. Yeah. But this mm -hmm. this specific one with headers yeah. where the where the command right. binds them relative to the file and is not counting will be checked. So the person on the Bezos team who implemented sandboxing got promoted for finding like multiple dozens of bugs in different orders. We had at the time. <laughs> we can send him. Just, just say. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 I think the CI would have wished run on the emergency machine where possible. So we expect that all such bugs have been caught. Yeah. If you, if you have a remote only builder somewhere, you have to like solve some of this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our CI is correct. Yeah, really. Our, our use of remote execution has caused so many of the issues. Like, I think it's a little bit remote execution. I mean, it's also something we see with most build system migrations from build systems that don't do isolation to something like Basel that, that does it. Uh, the build systems are usually while be wrong in many cases if you don't enforce the isolation. I mean, but for if, if it fails the worker, it would fall back to local. So mm -hmm. there are lots of ways where people have just got it wrong and you just fail back to local. Mm -hmm. because of it. We don't do that with boxes. Right. Then. All right. Thank you. Thank you.